And that ends our programs for schools and colleges. For <laughs> Bible. Stories from around the world, reflecting man's concern for his world. The world of survival. It's a sad commentary on man's attitude to the world around him that he places his nearest relations on this earth in deadly danger. He either hunts them practically to extinction or destroys their forest homes. Aerial reconnaissance has detected a poacher's camp in a distant part of Cohuzibiega National Park, Zaire. The park is the home of some of the few remaining mountain gorillas. So a patrol sets out on a raid to surprise the poachers. The captured poachers look almost pathetically harmless, yet their camp was set up to kill not only small animals for their skins, but gorillas for meat. They'll now go to jail for maybe a year. A light enough sentence when you consider that there are possibly only 10,000 mountain gorillas left in the world. Harmless looking, a few years back the warden's brother was killed by poachers in this very park. When filming this raid, survival's own cameraman narrowly escaped serious injury or even death when he stumbled on a well-hidden spring trap. There was a spear hidden in a pit nearby into which he fell, a spear intended for a gorilla. The gorilla poacher's camp is burned. Where the great apes are concerned, it's easy to see the poachers as the blackest villains. Yet they are not the ultimate enemy. To them, gorillas are just meat that can be eaten or sold. It's even difficult to blame them. At least it's easy to understand their motives. One can understand the motivation behind these scenes too. Yet they are far harder to condone. This continual whittling away of the forests in which the great apes live is something perpetrated by supposedly enlightened people. It's happening everywhere, sometimes justifiably to grow crops, but more often just to make a quick profit from timber. This, rather than casual poaching, is what is putting man's distant though nearest relations out of business. Change the scene now to the other side of the world, to Sumatra. You will notice that the scene is in fact remarkably unchanged. The primary rainforests there are coming down even faster to meet a ready market for the timber in Japan. And the victim this time? Another of the great apes, and the second subject of our story, the orangutan.
Due to the exaggerated tales of early travellers, our knowledge of the great apes has become distorted. Yerong was called the wild man of the forest, a fearsome man of the trees. As for the gorilla, his reputation needed no embellishment. Gorilla and orangutan. Now, at the 11th hour for both, we possess some of the knowledge needed to put the record straight. So let's look first at the orangutan. Both the mountain gorilla and the orangutan live in high rainforests. Rainforests are becoming scarcer and scarcer properties in a modern world hungry for food and greedy for quick profits. This is the Sumatran rainforest, one of the last refuges of the orangutan. Orangs today exist only on the islands of Borneo and Sumatra. In Sumatra, they're confined to forests at the northern tip. The orang differs from the gorilla in almost every aspect of its lifestyle. For a start, it lives almost entirely in the treetops. The arms, half as long again as a man's, are adapted for swinging and climbing. Hands and feet are enormously strong. The fingers powerful enough to break into a cement-hard termite's nest. Early naturalists classified the orang as quadrumanus, the four-handed beast. It's easy to see why. The feet, equipped with an opposable big toe, are as good as a second pair of hands for swinging and climbing. This youngster is about two years old. His climbing skill is instinctive, though it has to be perfected by practice. It has been known for young orangs to fall out of trees, badly injuring themselves. No gorilla would ever attempt to swing or climb like this. But then, of course, orangs are far lighter animals. An adult male weighs about 150 pounds to a male gorilla's 400 pounds. Both species are vegetarians, but with different ideas about where and what to eat. Where the gorilla feeds mainly on the ground, the orang finds practically all its food in the treetops. It's very partial to fruits, vines, and plants like wild peppers. Like the gorilla, the orang builds a nest to sleep in. In the orang's case, it's always in the trees. It just wouldn't feel safe on the ground. After all, tigers live in the forests of Sumatra. The gorilla doesn't have any large predators to worry it. This young orang makes its bed stronger and more comfortable by twining leaves and branches together. Bedclothes do have a way of being obstinate. There, that's better. Orangs are very much solitary animals. Another big difference between them and their African relatives among the great apes, the chimpanzee and the gorilla. About the only time togetherness applies in the world of the orangutan is when they're infants 
and must cling to their mother's breasts for food as well as for transport through the forest. Not for them the large family gathering. Here is a group of three orangs, a three-year-old orphan associating with a mother who has a tiny baby at her breast. The baby weighed about two pounds at birth. It'll be weaned at two years and will then be able to follow its mother through the treetops. By the time it's three to four years old, it will be fully independent. Everything the juvenile needs to know about contact with other orangs is either instinctive or learnt from the mother. Mother is also the best guide as to what's good to eat and what fruit and plants should be avoided. The best way of finding out is by tasting whatever mother happens to be eating, if you can get at it. All orang infants grow up in a one-parent family. They have no companions except their mother. They seldom know what it's like to play with other ape children. Their mother supplies all the play that's necessary. Only rarely do two infants of the same age meet in the forest. When they do, they're just as playful as young gorillas or chimpanzees. But young orangs soon lose their playful dispositions. By the time they're adolescents, they'll be solitary as like their parents. If these two meet again in a few years' time, they'll almost certainly ignore each other. The social life of Asia's so-called red ape is practically non-existent. Orangs keep within shouting distance of one another, especially when the males are looking for a mate, but that's about as far as it goes. Orangs are not territorial, though they keep to parts of the forest which they consider their home range. They seem to need to remain spread out, perhaps to conserve food supplies. Their calls ensure that they don't intrude on each other more than is necessary. Orangs have about 14 different types of call. The kiss squeak is given when the apes are afraid or angry. They are exceptionally peaceful animals, but when pushed to the limits of tolerance, they go beyond squeaking and throw twigs and leaves down to deter intruders. The orang at the top of the tree is very afraid. It's been isolated by tree-felling activities. Surrounded by humans and with no other trees to move into, it feels completely exposed. Orangutans are essentially gentle animals, but they do try to intimidate anything they find frightening by breaking branches and sending them crashing to the ground. Contrary to the early traveller's tales, the wild man of the forest is never a threat to man. All he wants is to be left alone. With its placid disposition and calm, human-like face, the orangutan gives the impression of being fully relaxed. That's perhaps more than can be said for his African relative, the mountain gorilla, as we'll see in a moment. Big, mean, fierce. This is everyone's picture of a mountain gorilla. This is the gorilla of the hunter's tales. The truth, as we're finding out at the 11th hour, is something very different.
except when confronted with a potentially dangerous situation like a human intruder. The gorilla is a shy creature, a true gentle giant. This is an adult male, a silverback. His charges are utterly terrifying, but they're seldom pressed home. Like the elephant's charge, they're the animal kingdom's ultimate in bluff. Gorillas live in equatorial Africa. There are two races, though some authorities say they're the same animal. The mountain gorilla in Rwanda and Zaire, the lowland gorilla, or western race, in the Cameroons and Gabon. Gorillas live in groups of from five to 30 members. They're led by an adult, a silver-backed male. He is responsible for their safety and welfare. Watch how he shepherds the young like a lollipop man at a school crossing. Second in command is this black-backed male, not yet grown to full maturity. Young males like this one, females, and even very small infants look to the silverback for reassurance and guidance. The black-backed mature males act as rear guard, ready to bark a warning if danger threatens. The silverback is in complete charge of his group. He indicates the direction the day's march will take in search of food. His followers watch him for signals. Even the direction in which he is looking tells them which way they should go. When he spots something that he considers a delicacy and sits down to eat it, the rest of the group follow his example. Despite the silverback supremacy, Membership of these groups is fairly fluid. Young males reaching maturity often abscond with one or two of the females. Sometimes outside males join the group with females in tow. Strangely enough, there seems to be very little sexual jealousy in a gorilla troop. For gorillas, most of whose forest life is spent on the ground, the group system works excellently. It provides protection, and makes best use of the senior male's ability to find the food the family needs. One of the definitions of a great ape, as opposed to a mere monkey, is that it walks on its knuckles rather than on the palms of its hands. Gorillas, like their three fellow apes, the chimps, orangs and gibbons, are perfectly capable of standing upright, but most of the time they move through the forest on all fours. Compared with the other three apes, they're ponderous but competent tree climbers. Privilege of rank ensures that the silverback goes up first to take the pick of the wild fruits and vines. One of the black-backed males is second in line once the silverback is well established. The rest of the troop follow according to their place in the hierarchy. Those who try to rise above their station are quickly shown who's who. Once the group is aloft in the tree that the silverback has chosen, it's every ape for himself. There's plenty of food to go round, just as long as the troop keeps moving on. The family will stay up in the branches until the silverback decides that they, or perhaps he, has had enough of that particular goodie.
Gorillas look either permanently obese or pregnant. The reason for the great ape's spare tire is that it needs to consume vast quantities of green stuff to fuel that huge frame. Like orangs, gorillas are strictly vegetarians. A fully grown male gets through about 60 pounds of leaves, fruits and vines every day of his life. And that's about the equivalent of 200 large apples or 60 cabbages. About 300 food plants feature on the gorilla's menu. Gorillas seem to know exactly when seasonal crops are ready for picking and led by the silverback move to the right area at the right time. Wild banana trees take a terrible beating when the silverback decides that one is ready for attack. It isn't the fruit that attracts them, but the bitter, pithy stem. Gorillas are never seen to drink. They get all the moisture they need from their food. Banana pith is one of the best providers of food and drink in a single package. Sometimes during the day, often around lunchtime, even a gorilla has to take a break for digestion. The siesta usually lasts for about an hour. It's accompanied by cavernous tummy rumblings. Often the young get bored before the lunch break is over. Then play fighting breaks out. It's all a game, but a useful game, which helps to establish their role in the hierarchy in later life. the gorilla and the orangutan. Both still a long way from man, but nevertheless coming closest to him of all forms of life on this earth. So different in many ways. The gorilla, the ape that believes in togetherness. The orangutan, the solitary man of the forest. The gorilla group relying on leadership for survival. The orang never in a group, except a maternal one when the mother is nursing her young. Vegetarians both, similar in some habits, especially when it comes to getting a good night's sleep. Similar too in their pacifist outlook on the world where a threat is countered with a purely ritual display of force. One is tempted to say different in personality, though personality is a purely human concept. The gorilla, a heavyweight, ponderous, cumbersome. The orangutan, mercurial, clownish, a trapeze artist among the branches. Now, when we are at last beginning to understand the fascinating details of their differing ways of life, we are in grave danger of denying our distant, though nearest relations, a place on Earth. We are doing so by destroying the very forest in which they and the other great apes live.